Hey folks, it's Joe at Emerald City Orchids, and today I'm very excited to talk about Angrecum sesquipedale. This is known casually as the Star of Bethlehem Orchid. They often bloom in December. It is December right now while we're recording it. Uh, this plant comes from Madagascar. It's a fascinating plant. It has a fascinating history, both in its evolution and also when it comes to people. It's called Angrecum sesquipedale because Angrec means uh, orchid in a native Indonesian language, and sesqua meaning one and a half pedale feet. And it's because the back of the flower has a nectary on a spur that's 18 inches long, one and a half feet. At the very bottom of it is a little drop of nectary goo that a moth will come along and eat. The moth has a proboscis that's 18 inches long and then unfurls while it, while it uh, feeds. It's commonly called an elephant moth because of its long trunk on it. Now, this plant was initially discovered in 1835, I think, by Charles Darwin when he was on the second voyage of the HMS Beagle. Darwin really came up with the idea, like the thunderbolt hit him with uh, evolution in the Galapagos. Now, he was on this boat for like five years and he was a science officer on the boat and he was supposed to be doing a geological survey looking at rocks, but he kept finding all these fossils and taking notes of all the weird animals and plants that he'd been seeing. After the Galapagos, the boat sails west. He sees Australia, all the marsupials and the weird things there. They cross over the Wallace Line, which if you're not sure what that is, um, that's an area that divides the ecology between all of the things that grow in Australia, the marsupials and whatnot and all of the things that kind of grow in East Asia, and it goes right along the tectonic plates. It's a very fascinating um, area of the world because on one side of the line, you'll have completely different animals and plants than on the other side. And Grecum sesquipedale is way past the Wallace line in Madagascar, right? The symbiosis between the plant and the moth that pollinates it is nearly exact. This is the only food source for this moth, and it's the only, um, pollinator for this plant. It's not just one Angrecum, there's many, many, many of these, and it's not just one moth, there's many of them. But Darwin found this thing and he postulated, he just guessed that there was a moth that had a nose that could eat all of this. Uh, when he got back to England, he wrote that and they all thought it was ridiculous, they couldn't believe it. Uh, turns out he was right. The moth is called Xanthopan morganae predicta, predicta because it was the one predicted by Darwin. So he was vindicated in the end, it was after he died, but it ended up being a very interesting discovery. This plant is not hard to grow, Our, uh, and Grecum tend to like a brighter light. They're in the Vanda families, they're related to Vandas. Uh, they like a brighter light. Uh, when you water them, water them real, real good, and then let the water run off. Um, you wanna water them here, we water them nearly every day in summer when the weather is very, very warm, and in winter, maybe just once or twice a week. Um, at this time of year, we're not really watering them that much because this color reflects moonlight very well. When the moth is flying to your light bulb, what they're really looking for are nocturnal blooming flowers that are reflecting this white light. That's why they tend to fly toward the light because this reflects moonlight so well. Now these ones here, normally we would sell them, but we're not gonna sell these ones this year. And that's because we have five of them. Four of them are blooming now and one has decided not to bloom this year. We're gonna try to cross pollinate these things because on the back of the flower is also the nectary. If we can get this to pollinate, this will turn into an, oh, it's an ovary. It'll turn into a seed pod. It'll get real big and it'll swell up and it'll have something like a quarter million seeds in it. When it's ready, we are gonna take this thing and we're gonna send it to a lab the seed pod will get uh, flasked and we can get up to quarter million seeds out of a single seed pod. So if we can get a few of these to pollinate, we're going to have several of these available for purchase in flask and as seedlings here in just a couple of years. This is a wonderful plant for most people to grow. You can grow it in a house. You can grow it uh, in a lot of different areas. Uh, it doesn't have to be grown in a greenhouse. It can be grown in, uh, under lights. There's lots of ways to grow this plant. It does very well in pots. If you're going to grow it in a pot, I would recommend a chunkier medium so that it drains very well. They like to drain. Uh, otherwise, you can mount them. As you see, this is on an a, a Osmunda tree fern uh, log, and it's growing very well. You can see the roots are growing into the fiber on the log. These have been mounted onto these logs for something like six years. They've been growing very well, and they bloom every single year for us. Absolutely beautiful plant. Highly recommended for anybody who's a very serious orchid collector, you should have this one in your collection. 
because of the history involved with it. It's this orchid and some other very key orchids that really kind of gave a lot of inspiration to the idea of evolution and opened up a lot of um, Western mentality to um, different ways of looking at plants because this plant is so unique and it's so different and it's evolved to such an, uh, a strange flora form that it really makes it something special in the orchid world. Thank you.